our team of researchers and explorers are headed to Campbell River, British Columbia, to meet with our friend and guide, Thomas Seward, our Bigfoot expert and experiencer. We are going to delve into real-life Bigfoot encounters, explore Vancouver Island's traces of Bigfoot, and try to discover if Bigfoot truly does exist. Hi, my name is Kiana, and I am Bigfoot Girl. I welcome you today on this journey to discover and experience Bigfoot. We are going to meet up with podcaster James Tyson, who is an experiencer of the supernatural. We are going to learn a little bit about his journey and why he is here today. Let's go. James, it's a pleasure. Oh, wonderful to meet you too. Nice to meet you. James, can you tell us a little bit about why you're here today? Why do you want to go and discover Bigfoot and go on the journey? Well, it, it, it was, offered to me to go along with a little group, what about six or seven of us, over to the what is it, east side of Vancouver Island on the property of a fellow named Thomas Seawood, who have, I have talked to numerous times as an experiencer. I, I bumped into him down in Kennewick, Washington at a uh, Bigfoot conference, International Bigfoot conference down there, mm -hmm. and fascinated with the stories of he and his son being chased out of the property by what he describes as Sasquatch, the big hairy, mm. the big hairy critter. Yep. And uh, it's going to be just fantastic to get up to this property that not too many people are allowed into. And it's not something you could just drive up and, and uh, pull over and walk into it. It's going to take a bit of a hike yep. to get in there. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting in and actually investigating this property. Mm. And I'm fascinated with Bigfoot. Um, I, I, I have a podcast, and, and in, I think, 2014, I was talking to a number of the psychics that were on that TV series, Psychic Detective and oh, yeah. Psychic Investigator, mm -hmm. and we had strange ET contacts were coming through, and they were talking about Bigfoot and what is it and things like this, and I was fascinated with that and the information that I was getting, not only from one person, but another person, and kind of, it was just putting all that information together. And I've had the opportunity to talk to people like Tom Gimlin of the Patterson Gimlin film from 50 years ago in Northern California of the Bigfoot walking across the creek. Uh, yep. And to look into that man's eyes, that gentleman, as he recants that story of actually seeing Bigfoot. And it, it, it just was so passionate and his understanding of what he saw in hindsight, mm. at the time, I could imagine, you know, he's trying to keep the horses still and, and Patterson's doing the eight millimeter photos of it and Thomas is, is wondering what the heck's going on. But in hindsight and the understanding of what he had seen and his lifetime now of talking to people who have experienced the same thing mm -hmm. and his passion about it. Uh, had also the opportunity to talk to a fellow named Lyle Blackburn uh, connected to the uh, Boggy Creek Monster uh, mm -hmm. down in the southern U.S. and his experience is going out and his passion in interviewing people who've experienced to be offered a chance to pop, just hang around and pop over to mm -hmm. Vancouver Island with the rest of the crew. Uh, couldn't have asked for anything better. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and your experiences with the supernatural? How does that all Ooh. pertain to this um, scenario of going to see Bigfoot? Because I know there's a lot of people who don't believe and there's a lot of people that do. 
And I don't know if any of your experiences of uh, the previous with the supernatural can at all interact with in, this. It in, in meld together. Yes, well, exactly. my experience is basically is ever since I was a little kid, I've seen dead people, oh. which can be awkward. And then I spent 28 years as a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police where I saw dead people and dead people. Mm. So it was kind of a blend. I saw most of the ghosts and spirits as uh, maybe under the age of 17, 18. Uh, I stopped seeing the full on like someone is standing there. Uh, wow. A couple of times as a policeman I, I saw it and I just kind of wrote that off. And in 2012 I had an experience actually a psychic I got an opportunity to go see a psychic who I never had any belief in. I was very skeptical. Yep. I still am a bit of a skeptic, but I'm a skeptic that goes and tries to figure these things out. And uh, the psychic told me my mother was standing be behind me over my shoulder, and she told me my mother's name was Lexa, L-E-X-A. Well, pick that out of a hat mm. when she only knows me as James. You know, that's, that's, that's a yeah. bit of a fluke. Then kind of told me about these things I saw when I was a kid. And she goes, oh yeah, those were really dead people. Those were ghosts. And she knew what I had seen. It was, it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And then she told me that I was something called an empath and I could read cards for people. And I just, oh, okay, whatever. And then she got me hooked up to a paranormal team. And I was having conversations like I'm having with you with yeah. disembodied people. Uh, within two weeks and from there I got into I got asked to do a an internet radio show in 2014 and from that I developed another podcast and off I went I'm just asking so many questions and when it comes to Bigfoot I'm still you people are all having a lot of fun and so interested in this and you're getting out doing it I want to see if it's real too so to get this opportunity to, to kind of quench that thirst for knowledge about this animal, mm -hmm. this critter, this being, you know, I couldn't turn it down. I want to, you know, do I want to believe? Of course I do, but what is it? And uh, is it something that is in myth? Is it, a, is it moving through like a ghost or is it knocking down trees? And this is the opportunity I am uh, taking to go out. And I've got my little bag of, uh, of stuff to pour into a footprint if we ever do yes, find one yes. and hopefully that which i'm hoping yeah hopefully find, it will so. it will come out so well we're so happy to have you along with us on this journey and i just can't wait to see what happens and if we're able to find bigfoot if we're able to get some prints like you said um or even just anything with them being in the presence of bigfoot is going to be interesting even just a smell that would be great something. yeah just a little something <sighs> I would be, I'd be perfectly happy. excellent <laughs> well let's go and see what we can find let's go. What is Bigfoot? Sasquatch. Since the middle of the 1800s, this being, this mysterious mythical beast, is it a hoax or is it real? Over the next few minutes, we'll be interviewing people about their own experiences with this creature. Is it an alien shapeshifter known as the Echo? Is it actually the missing link. Is it something that anyone can see or is it something gifted to those who encounter it? We don't know, but the people that we are going to talk to surely believe in it. They've all had their own personal experiences. This is going to be fascinating. This animal has been around allegedly for over a hundred years. Let's find out from these people what their experiences are. Sure, a lot of people have said they've seen it, but really? Let's dig down a little bit deeper. and go see Bigfoot. Now, Campbell River, they say, is known as a hub of Bigfoot. This is where Bigfoot really resides. So I'm super excited to go back there and hopefully we'll be able to re-encounter him today. So let's go. So 
we've been on the boat for about uh, an hour right now. Uh, we've been able to look over to the different islands and sort of see the different landscapes of where Bigfoot could be residing. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about my experience with Bigfoot. Now, I was six years old at the time, and my father and I, we always used to go exploring into the woods. That was our thing. Any place we could go, we, we, would, we would look at the trees and the rocks and the grounds. And one day, uh, in Campbell River, and this is why Campbell River to me is so important, we went there and we were searching through the woods and out of the blue I see it. You can't explain it. It's not an ape and it's not a human. It's like a mixture of those two but in such a large form and it doesn't look human. And if I could tell you it's Bigfoot, it is. And this is why this adventure is so important to me. I want to be able to see it again. I want to find the prints. I want to, to delve in a little bit further and see people with the other experiences and compare them to mine and really get this Bigfoot into the universe of Bigfoot. I want to be able to show a little bit more about it. So we're going to be meeting up with Thomas Seward and he is a Bigfoot experiencer. Uh, he has claimed there has been many um, spots within Campbell River uh, that have Bigfoot sightings. Now I would really like to be able to see a print or two and We'll just have to sort of explore, see what happens. So, I don't know what to expect. Uh, I think that's the anticipation of this all, which is the most exciting part. Um, however, it, just to be back into the area where I first experienced Bigfoot is such a thrill. And I'm really looking forward to talking with everybody today um, when we get there. Uh, so we're just starting the journey and I just can't wait to see what happens next. We're heading out to Campbell River, just outside Campbell River, British Columbia. It's on Vancouver Island. We're going to be meeting our friend and guide, Thomas Seawood, our Bigfoot expert and experiencer. It's interesting. We're going to be heading to a camp that he has been chased out of, or had been chased out of in 2006 by what he believes is the Bigfoot, or a big fella as he calls him. With me is Ashley, and uh, Ashley is a member of the Canadian Paranormal Investigators that I'm a member of and worked with her for quite a while. Vancouver Island, big chunk of land here on the Pacific Northwest, second largest island in the Pacific Ocean after New Zealand, which is kind of an uninhabited area. Lots of cities, and that's where the main population is, but so much, so much land that only people may have trekked around in the last hundred years or so other than the First Nations or the Canadian Indian uh, population that does occupy the majority of the north end of this island. It's been nice, uh, lawfully sunny, but of course, you're gonna go out hunting the big guys, gonna put up some blocks in your way and throw out some rain. Should be a lot of fun though. So we just met up with Thomas Seawood and he's going to be taking us uh, to the area of Campbell River where he's had experience with Bigfoot. I'm excited and I'm anxious and there's a bunch of emotions happening for me right now. This is something that I've wanted to do for so long and now that we're finally in the area it makes it so much more surreal. So we'll hopefully find some proof and I'm 
really excited for the night. So we'll see what happens. I'm a member of the Kwakwakiwak Nation from northeastern Vancouver Island and the northern portions. And northeast from Vancouver Island is what they call the Broughton Archipelago, my homeland of the Mamliakha tribe. And in the late 1980s, I was sent out by my chief and council to be a watchman and a guardian of our abandoned native village, known very famously as Mama Lalakula, from village of the last potlatch. Far from the truth, because if you go to the Umijsta Cultural Center in Alert Bay, you can un come to understand or speak to one of our people, like myself and others, and you come to understand that we survived the dark days of the banning of the potlatch from 1851 to 1961. But our village, all the same, is abandoned with totem poles on the ground and big house remains. And it's out in the middle of Timbuktu, I like to say, and it's been abandoned for over 20 years in 1988. And it was overgrown with berry bushes and brush and thorns and stinging nettles. And of course, the people, my ancestors, some of my family even that lived there up until the mid 1900s, their fruit trees went wild. So this place is just filled with berries and during midsummer and late summer into early fall, plums, cherries at one part of the year, apples and crab apples. And it's a beautiful place. And tourists will come from around the world to come walk through Mama Lalakula, village of last potlatch. And I was the watchman guardian there from the mid late 1980s right through until around 2013. And I lived out there many years all by myself and I had a trailer we'd put on the beach 26 feet long with the little 10 by 10 foot addition and at night time when it got dark I'd try to go to sleep as fast as I could because in late summer early fall you'd hear the hollering and the screaming or you'd hear them harvesting the plums behind the trailer at the abandoned homestead site that we're at and you knew they weren't bears or deer or other humans. They were the big fellas, Sasquatch, Bigfoot. In my language of Kwakwala, we refer to those creatures as Junakwa. Sasquatch, the bush code is harvesting as much protein in the least amount of time with the least expenditure of energy, period. And once you equate tree structures and glyphs and um, tree knocks and all these other things, it breaks the law of the bush, harvesting as much food in as little time with the least amount of energy expelled. So in other words, a Sasquatch in a forest area it's, it's, you know, if there's not a lot of high concentration protein, they don't have time to expend energy building these big, huge sculptures. Just hippies that smoke pot have time to do that in the forest. Like when you look at pictures on the internet, and people go on the creeks and build these beautiful balancing rock structures. Why well, a human's got three squares a day and a credit rating and a credit card. He can go to any drive through he wants and fill his belly. He has time to go into a creek and build these structures. Sasquatches don't. Out here, it's all about survival. I mean, they need a lot of protein for something that big. Well, to run that machine. I honestly think they need 6,000 calories a day or more, equivalent to what a grizzly bear needs. And this stretch along here, there's just so many reports through the years that I've, you know, heard second, third, fifth hand even, of people seeing things on this highway day and night. So, you know, like I say, it's very thick, so the chances of seeing one with the leaves on the trees is pretty tough because you know it's uh, end of summer but winter time when uh, leaves are all down you can see a lot further you hear the odd report here and there in winter but mainly in the springtime and the summer early summers when you get a lot of uh, sighting reports along here Along our path to discover Bigfoot, we met up with Steve and Tracy, who gave us their insights on their experiences with Bigfoot. It was kind of a date, and... Uh, 
it was the uh, third week in October, there was lots of snow, and uh, so we drove up to about kilometer 26 on the Forest Road Highway. We realized there was too much snow to get up there uh, all the way to the, to the springs themselves, so we stopped. We were going to turn around, we ran into these snowmobilers. They had offered to piggyback us up on their machines, but we would have to walk back. We agreed, although we weren't really dressed for winter, because at the time we didn't realize there was a bunch of snow up there, because of course coming from the main, lower mainland. So we agreed anyways, because I wanted her to see this, uh, these hot springs and to, to you know, get into them and that. So we went up there, uh, they gave us a ride up, we walked about a, close to a half a block in, down a trail, to get to the Meager Creek Hot Springs. We were in the springs, we were having lots of fun. Uh, there was a cold river, the Meager Creek itself was running by, so we could jump into this cold water when it got too hot, so we must have spent about two hours there. And then it was time to go back, we were kind of tired, but we ended up climbing up the trail and we had to walk back, it was about a half a mile to the car. We started following because we were not it dressed for, for winter, so we started walking down back to the truck in on the, the skidoo rats. pass yeah. so that we wouldn't sneak too far into the snow. We got about a halfway there, Tracy was behind me, and she says, well, I wonder, what's that? She points out, she sounded kind of, uh, kind of uh, perturbed. She goes, what's that? And I turned around and she pointed to this thing across, across the river and across the, the delta of the river and the rocks and that, up a little bit up, up the mountain, about 30, 40 feet up the mountain. She's pointing to this thing, and there had been a fire there a couple years prior to that, so it burned everything out. So there was only a couple of uh, uh, burnt out trees here, and the odd one falling down, but it was pretty kind of barren. A lot of little uh, sort of rock sliding coming down. So she's pointing this thing, and I'm looking across, and I'm going, What is that? And she's still pointing at it, and she goes, What is that? She says as well. So I'm looking, and I go, Well, geez, that can't, what, that, you know, that's not a tree stump. Like, what is that? I'm thinking, Your mind tells you it's. Something, something, it's a bush, it's a, a tree yeah. or something, but it's not. And we're looking and looking, and we see, we could see this thing against a tree. We could see, I mean, it was a fair distance away, you know, probably a half a block or something. So we couldn't see the face itself or anything, but there was this thing standing, leaning against the tree. You could see its two legs, uh, and it was kind of, and it was motionless. It didn't move, and that's what kind of threw me off. So I was going, threw her off too, but... She's going, what is that? What is it? It can't be a tree because there's this creature. We don't yeah. know what it is. This hairy creature, brown creature standing there. And we're going, geez, and we're staring at it. We're st we must have looked at it for at least a minute, minute and a little bit, right? Like we're staring because we're thinking, God, it has to be a bush. I mean, it has to be a tree or a bush. But, it, you know, and then it's all of not. a sudden, this wave of fear came. For, I don't know why. This wave of fear came over. And she says at the same, right after that wave of fear comes, she goes, I wonder if that thing could get here in time. And that was it. We started running down the track to our truck. We had about a quarter mile to go and we were freaking out. Cause we thought this thing for, even though it was a fair distance away, sort of, it could probably catch us before we could get to the truck. We for the, ran for our lives, almost. It was terrifying. We ran, got in the truck, started the truck and boom, we were gone. And uh, it's crazy, you know, no matter what we you say, it, yeah. it's, yeah. You know, um, we didn't tell her, anybody really until no. now. It's been largely just maybe a, put a, a, put a away family, for years. friend, or a, fa a family member. Yeah. One or two family members never really, talked about it. Because that ridicule factor crazy. is so. Yeah, people you know, say you're nuts. Yeah. But we saw it. Yeah. And that's that. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, we're just looking as we get into the kayak camp for any animals. As we seen when we came around the corner, I saw the color of what I thought was elk, and sure enough, they're bedded down. That's telling me that there's been no other vehicle activity down this road today. You hear all the uh, encounters, people come around a corner and see a uh, Sasquatch. Well, me seeing bedded down elk tells me no other traffic. It tells me that the possibilities of seeing one are going to be pretty good if they're around here. But we'll see. We'll just keep going. Since 2000, the 
numbers of reports of Sasquatches has increased who knows how many fold. And when I went to central United States and saw on that Indian reservation all the Sasquatches they have, and I hear the stories from Washington State's native people and non-native and British Columbia and Southeast Alaska and Alberta and Northwest Territories and the Yukon and the list goes on. Well, the Indians are proliferating like bunnies. So are the Sasquatch Bigfoot. So we are on the verge of conclusive proof of Sasquatch Bigfoot. And we have to be prepared for that. But the main thing what I'm getting to is quit gifting to those creatures. race exterminated because we didn't take precautions so that we wouldn't contaminate them. So use your frontal lobe, show that it's well developed when you meet your Sasquatch Bigfoot to have that close encounter of the hairy kind. group decided to press on in order to catch up with the rest of the crew. James and his crew were headed down the mountain. We had quite the trek to catch up. probably swollen like a basketball right now because I've had an injury. So that's going to be fun. Our group was still lost. There were no signs of a mountain drop anywhere in sight. We started back to square one and took a different route. We were hoping to meet up with them sooner than this, but sometimes this is what happens on adventures. Well, we're here. At Tom Seward's special secret hideaway, where he uh, actually got chased out of here by Bigfoot around 2006. And it was quite a trek in off uh, the highway through some dirt roads and on the logging trails. And we went by a lot of areas, saw a lot of great wildlife, a lot of. Um, oh, it started off by seeing a giant squirrel. Okay, that wasn't it. Right? But we did see some wonderful herds of elk. I'm looking out right now at a beautiful scene of uh, water. Uh, Coast Guard ships clearing the point around that side. Uh, we're actually staying in a little hut here. And it's uh, rustic. Rustic's a good way of putting it. Uh, there's a sea otter feeding area right behind me. You can see a lot of sea urchins that we found that uh, had been brought in by the sea otters. So wildlife abounds in this area. In fact, I'm thinking of seeing a sea otter on the other side there, but uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful, calm place. It was raining earlier in the day, but tonight, tonight's uh, when the fun begins. So we're here at Thomas Seawood's camp. Uh, it was a definitely a long hike to get here. We actually got lost for quite a while. 
uh, but we actually caught up with James and the rest of the crew, which was good. James hurt himself hiking, um, hiking to the location. So he's just resting in his hut right now. I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to see him for the rest of the night. Um, they're gonna be starting campfire shortly and we're gonna feel the energy and, and just get a sense of being in the, in the presence of Bigfoot and his lands. So it's definitely exciting. I'm nervous, I'm anxious. There's a bunch of emotions happening again and it just, oh, I just can't wait to see what happens. The huts are made of plywood and the beds are physically made of plywood. So it's gonna be very interesting to see if we actually get any sleep done tonight. Uh, but I'm sure the energy's here and our excitement is gonna keep us up uh, to hopefully see Bigfoot. Let's listen in to Thomas Seward's real life experience with Bigfoot that happened here, right at the camp or secret hideaway, as it is also known. 2006, I had a tour company with a 12 passenger aluminum tour boat and I had a camp that has five cabins. I still actually have it. Look, that are made of red cedar that look like traditional native longhouses, except they're small, like a garden shed. Just enough room for a queen size bed and a couple and their child to sleep in. Nice and warm. And it's on Vancouver Island's eastern shore on the Orca Highway of Johnson Strait, so you can watch the orcas. My sister wanted to see it, and she's 10 years younger than me, and she's a concrete Indian. She's growing up in the city world. So I brought her out, and I had a young native worker from Campbell River, and I had a young Dutch fella who was my sea kayak guide. And we're, we're moving driftwood from the beach, because the uh, tides come in, and they're big tide, the logs get washed up onto my beach, and you can't bring your kayak on there, and you can't walk on there safely, because some of these logs are two meters thick almost. And uh, there was all this debris, and I wanted to cut it up with my big chainsaw, and then push it out when high tide came that evening. And so we had a nice clear beach from when my guest showed up in a few days. So two gas tanks in my power saw, and you gotta remember, this is the largest chainsaw they make, and I'm cutting away, and run out of gas, fill it up, start cutting again. And when I'm finished, the two tanks worth of gas and the job's done, I'm all hot and sweaty. And I said to one of the boys, grab me a pop. And I grabbed the pop and I started taking a drink and I sat down on a folding chair on the beach, huffing and puffing and all of a sudden, just heard trees shaking. And I looked to my right and there's my cookhouse cabin and about 15 feet up is a rock bluff and there's these two trees about that thick each, just shaking like when you see a spook movie and you see those people shaking beyond normal. That's what these trees reminded me of. And all of a sudden this big boulder, like I'm talking big, like huge, comes and you hear the roots ripping and trees breaking. And I looked at my dog and he's a golden lab cross bush dog and he's six years old so he's well trained. I could just go spin bear and he'll chase a black bear and nip at its tail so he spins the black bear so I can get out of there. So you know you don't want to shoot every bear just because it's got an attitude. You know you got to use your frontal lobe and show that the animal kingdom needs respect. So get your dog to spin the bear and walk away. Call your dog, get in the boat, leave. So anyway, land claims was his name. Um, everybody lifted his leg to pee, we were going to claim it back as Indians, that's why I called them land claims. But anyway, I go, Landy, go check! And he runs up that rock wall. It's, you know, got a slope, so it's not straight up and down. And he gets up and he looks behind the trees that are shaking, and he just goes, ping! And he springs, and you see this blonde blur come, hit the ground, and he just phew, goes streaking past me. And, you know, I'm not worried about my dog. I'm like, okay, the dog left. Okay, what's up? And then being a bushman, you don't just look at where the noise is. You got to be smart. You got to look left and right, your other points. And as I look to my right behind the cookhouse, some 20 feet, I guess, behind the cookhouse in the wall of trees, evergreens, there's this thing from this part up looking at me. Shoulders were like that wide. And when I looked at it, it looked at me, then I went, and I could see the tendons and wrinkles on its neck and its eyes scrunch up. And I was just like, whoo, geez, that thing's big. And I'm like, hey guys, where's my gun? Oh, it's out on the boat. They didn't know I was looking at one and they're still looking at the trees shaking. And I looked at my sister, I'm like, get in the dinghy, we gotta get to the boat. 
There's two of them now. I'm seeing trees shake and a boulder just got rolled down the hill at me and not 45, 50 feet over this way behind my cookhouse is another one standing there grimacing at me. So I'm like, Louise, get in the boat. We got to get out of here. And it's a duck punt little dinghy. Now my 12 passenger tour boat sitting in the middle of this bay like that with his bow pointing out because there's wind that evening and I wanted it to ride at anchor. But I also got a starboard and a port line to beach and a stern line to beach to keep it perfectly sitting. I don't want it to swing and hit the beach because of the wind that evening. Well, I look at my dog and he's over in my dinghy already in it, cowered down, big tough bush dog land claims. And here's my sister trying to be Jesus Christ walking across the water. It's high tide, all the driftwood's floating. She's like going like that. And I'm like, slow down, you're gonna break a leg. And she's trying to get to the dinghy. And I'm like, where's my gun? And out in the boat. And I'm like, well, give me an ax or a machete. And I'm like, you guys get in that dinghy and get out of here because I had two dinghies. So they run over and they're Jesus Christ too. They're trying to walk on water. And they get in their dinghy, I get in mine. And my sister starts pulling that stern line and pulling the dinghy out to the main boat. Well, it's rectangle shape. Now she's almost flipping it because she's so freaked out. And I'm like, slow down, Louise. I said, you're going to flip us over. And we get maybe six feet from the boat swim grid. And my dog just bails, jumps, gets on the swim grid. He's half in the water, gets into the boat. I climb on the boat. And I'm like, you guys cut the sidelines and cut the anchor. I'll start her up. And I went inside the boat, turned both keys from each motor, fired her up. My sister's running in. And she's like, what's that? What are they? I said, they're Sasquatches. Don't worry about it. And she's all freaked out. I look out in the bow of my boat and there's the Dutch fella and he's crying. He's like, oh, whimpering like a baby and he's bumbling and fumbling the lines and he's this freak. I'm like, oh, for God's sakes, you guys. So I grabbed my 338 rifle and I walked on deck and I was just standing there trying to make these guys be reassured that, hey, we got a gun now, but also showing those big fellas that, hey, this is my kayak camp. You know, you don't come down there and scare us out of there. You know, you got my workers and my sister scared beepless. And all of a sudden you hear that. Rah! My sister's, oh, what's that? And that's when I thought, ah, you sons of guns. So I put one in the tube and lifted it up in the air. And boom. Another one. Boom. You guys get out of here and you can have the camp tonight. But I want it back tomorrow and you guys leave me alone. It's my kayak camp. I'm staying here. So we left on the boat, but it was too windy to get down to Sayward. Because when it's westerly wind in the summer with a big ebb tide like we had, you have mountainous waves, dangerous. So I went across to this place called Port Neville and we tied up to the dock there and all four of us slept on the boat that night. Next morning, no wind, we went to Sayward. My sister hasn't been back to camp. And the day after, I went into that camp and I lit her up like World War III. I went in with a bunch of buddies and a bunch of shotguns and rifles and we lit her up. A couple hundred shots were fired. Okay, right here behind me is where that big boulder is in the rock bluff that where it got pushed down. But you can see these cedar trees here. And that's where that one was standing, not what, 25 feet from me? And back then, you gotta remember, that was 11 years ago. It was like a V and that's where that thing was standing. And the next day when we came down here, we could see depressions in the moss where that thing was standing and the feet were probably about that big and we guesstimated with tape measures that that thing would have been standing seven foot four in order for me to see from here to the top of its head so it was a big bugger and just above us here it goes straight up to about 5,000 feet that's uh, Newcastle Ridge and that's where the famous five plaster casts were cast that uh, this hunter found and he cast them in mud that was dry and Dr. John Bindernagel he bought four of the five casts one of them was broken and lost but they're considered to be some of the top five casts that were ever cast on Vancouver Island and I have a replica and it's 18 inches long so I kind of figure that possibly it was the same bugger that rolled that big rock down on me. Here we go right here, you can see the big rock left. Right at the base here, there's a big boulder right here. And that was the one that was pushed down on us. So we're hanging uh, tr cherries to entice the Bigfoot to come down. Um, James, had his psychic friend, told him to bring cherries. So hopefully this will be 
a yummy and welcome treat for our Bigfoot fella. Um, we're just hanging it above ground so, uh, you know, bears or other like raccoons and skunks don't come in and eat them. Hopefully we will get the Bigfoot and he'll come down and he'll be munching out on some cherries. While Ashley set up the cherries to entice Bigfoot, she also set up the night cameras to catch any movement or presence of Bigfoot. I reckon we put one of the cameras on the tree past there. So if he's coming down through this brush, this opening part here, which seems like the easiest way to come through if he's gonna probe us, Thomas's words, not mine, then we're gonna be able to capture any activity. So maybe I'll go put it up over there. Back at the camp, the fire is getting started for the long night ahead of us. Always pull from your bottom and bring up. See the cedar I cut? You always start it and then you bring it up from the bottom. Now you need bigger stuff. We sat around the fire, waiting for the sun to set to begin our quest through the night. It's one of the most humbling experiences to ever have. It scares the bejesus out of you, I'll say that. Like, man, you want to feel your heart pounding, you want to feel your legs shake. Well, you get close to Sasquatch Bigfoot, especially when you smell it. It has that smell like a person you see on the street that lives there, and you know they haven't showered for weeks, if not months, and you get that bad human odor. Well, it's the same smell, but 10 or 20 times worse. It makes you want to gag. And when you see them, it's just amazing. It's, I can only imagine what it would be like to see the white killer whale, because I love orcas so much, in Russia. I can only imagine what it would be like to be in Australia to see that white humpback whale do a full-out breach and boom, like thunder when it hits. Maybe one day I'll get to experience that. But right now, I'm experiencing something just as grand in the animal kingdom, and that's seeking to try to get that up close. Never know, maybe I will get a Jane Goodall and a Diane Fossey moment with Sasquatch Bigfoot if I show them enough respect. That's what I'm after. We were able to use the night vision cameras to try to detect traces of Bigfoot. As the night progressed, we thought we had seen Bigfoot, but our eyes were playing tricks on us, sometimes catching our friends. I just got woken up by what seemed to be knocking or rocks or something um, on the trees. And I'm not sure if that was just animals here or if that was a sign that Bigfoot's here. Um, so far, we, that's what all we've heard. Uh, Jason and Ashley actually heard earlier. Um, it was like a whooping sound, like really, really loud, very distinct whooping. Um, really disappointed I didn't hear it but um, two of our crew have, so that was definitely interesting. 
I'm a little disappointed so far that I haven't heard more and I haven't seen more. Um, but you know, there's still more of the night to go, so keeping my hopes up high and hopefully um, we're going to be able to at least see a little bit more. Um, we'll probably check out the night cameras, make sure everything's still working properly and getting everything we can. We have cherries uh, set up for Bigfoot, so hopefully that's going to lure them, lure them into us as well, so we have to see. In the morning, we spoke with the crew to deliberate on our findings. In describing, um, you know, our camp setting last night, you, you, I would probably describe this as a typical campsite that any group goes out to have. You're sitting around the fire, um, enjoying the company of each other, listening to some of the most amazing stories from Tom as he recounts his history and. Um, uh, so the atmosphere was set. Um, we were really enjoying ourselves, almost kind of forgetting really kind of what we're here to do. We're here to, to find an encounter, um, but we're just enjoying ourselves so much. And I guess it was really late into the night. Um, once the, you know, the light had truly, we, we sort of got to the, <laughs> the darkest part of the night, we could begin to hear sounds um, in different places uh, from around the camp. Uh, we're in a little horseshoe bay, so um, uh, there's only kind of three points, you know, around us. We could begin to hear sound both from the, from the, the, the left to the right and directly behind us, uh, w whether it was uh, knocks on wood. A few of our crew who was with us had heard um, a howling sound. Um, and, um, you know, at that point, I would say th the tone of the night changed a little bit. And you could tell there was uh, just a feeling like, what's, what's going to happen next? And as people sort of headed to their, their cabins, um, uh, it was with a little bit of, uh, I wouldn't say fear, but uh, the mood was a little more somber as we headed into the cabins, wondering what potentially could could happen well last night I didn't see the big guy at all uh, we kept our eyes open we set up some trail cams last night and we're gonna be checking those later uh, there were some sounds though I headed up a bit early to my cabin just up in here on the point and as I got above uh, where the main part of the beach was I could hear knocking and I looked back towards the camp where a couple of the other guys were and nobody was doing any knocking this was from a distance and it was just bunk, 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 bunk. And it was a rhythm. It, it, and faster than somebody would be chopping wood. And a hollow sound at a distance. So that's of interest. We did put some uh, sound devices out, some uh, microphones in the area. We'll see if we can pick that up. But uh, nobody came and chased us out of the camp. But again, we're only here for one day for one night. Uh, Thomas comes up here and he's up here for a week or two and maybe gets one instance of something coming into his camp. So we'll see. We'll see. We're going to come back uh, someday and uh, spend a little more time here and see what's going on. So this is this, the, actually the very first footprint that was found earlier today by Ashley. This print itself, again, 14, 15 inches, and not overly wide, maybe uh, six inches wide. It's pushed down this part here. So I'm not including this part of the footprint. The footprint really ends right about here. Starts up at the toe. Here. Use my bush pointer. Again, footprint starts or uh, ends here and this is the toe and this pile is what was pushed as it went up the hill again this is uh this isn't something i can leave i'm 235 pounds i can't leave a footprint in this standing on it so that's of interest because it does go down maybe an inch into the uh 
the pine and the soft pine. Again, we have Ashley. She's tracking it still up the ridge. She's a good 100 meters away, 100 yards away right now. So uh, this one's a bit of an angle, but I'm going to try to take a cast out of there because you can see the toe marks up in here. Again, first try at a cast in uh, pine needles. Basically, all it could do is not set. So we'll see how it goes. And uh, hopefully we can get a good cast. Hopefully uh, Ashley comes up with another good footprint and uh, we'll make a cast of that one. So that's our next mini adventure up on the trail. So here's where I believe the print ends. And this lump here is what's been pushed down from the weight of this, uh, whatever made this track. The toe, like a big toe mark here. And all these are the toes. Comes down to the sides. See the animals, the deer and the elk, smaller elk, will not want to walk through here because it's too easy for a cougar to pounce. That's right, yeah. So, and they can't see or they're hear the predators. But for the bigger animals, like your bears and your big elk and your um, Bigfoot, this is where they're going to use because, like me, you know, I'm I knew that with this trench, it's going to lead up to that logging road. And there should be, because you got water coming down. That's right, yeah. It's going to be cleared. And, you know, as we can see, something's been using this. Up there is like where your creek, this, you know how your creek meets down over here? Yeah. There's another creek up there. Yeah. And I saw what looked like a handprint. It, to me, it looked like a handprint because it's, you could see where a thumb may have been and um, the four fingers is it and so it could have been like putting leaning down to take a drink because there's like a little pool of yeah. water there so is it able to be poured Pour. mm, maybe yeah probably yeah, we should yeah. Uh, definitely take a look at that because that's see like i say with here you know when you come here to this camp we're all stinking to join up they're curious they want to see what's up mm -hmm. and this is their route they're going to come through well, I did hear something by the fire, like when we were at the fire, I did hear something, um, sound like tree, like um, something breaking, like a log breaking or something getting stepped on. But I mean, it could have just been... Branch falling. Yeah. And you know, you got to remember with the higher tide last night too, the wood, k-tunk, And before dark, there was some driftwood floating in the bay. Mm -hmm. So when they hit the beach, you know, and then we had cruise ships going by and they yeah. a hell of a clunking noise. Well, I heard something last night too, and it sounds, okay, do you know like when you have an empty bottle or empty jug and you blow into the, like that, it makes that hollow, that's that kind of, that weird sound. I heard that a bunch of times last night, and I know Jason heard it as well. Well, there's a reason why we came here. <laughs> Bigfoot Central for Northeastern Vancouver Island. Have you ever heard some, a similar noise? Yeah, they, you know, they chatter. The best way is if you want to know what a Sasquatch sounds like in this region, and when they're communicating back and forth, talking, watch the gods must be crazy. And that little bushman, how he, bloop, 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 and it, as he talks, yeah, his yeah. traditional language, that's pretty much similar to what I hear out here when they're communicating back and forth and close proximity. You hear that lip popping. And then of course you got the whoops and what you heard like blowing in a bottle. Like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, it was you like. You get the ooh, chimpanzee type. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh. Like, you know, that hollow sound from like the, yeah. from like an empty jug. Yeah, that's what it sounded like to me. Oh, and yeah. I heard it heaps. And then, um, and then the big whoop that we heard, like as we were setting up the trail cams. You guys did hear a whoop. We did hear one. We heard a whoop. Like, we were setting, it was just at, just as dusk was um, coming into play, and then we heard a whoop that came over there, and we just, like, stopped. And we, like, looked at each other, and we're like, did you hear that? <laughs> There's owls around, too. You know, you always gotta... But it's, like, I've heard an owls before. I've heard owls. It's like the... Some... It sounded more ape-like. I, I, if I would have to compare it to something, it would sound like more like a chimpanzee. And then I gotta go with you. Your gut feeling, more than likely, it was one of them. So it looks like this cast is done now, and uh, I'm going to pull it out now. Don't expect me to flip it over and see a perfect footprint because you're on pine needles. So I'm going to pull it up, out, you're going to flip it over, and you're just going to see a plastic cast covered in pine needles. So, <laughs> but that's a good size. Big toe, little toes would have been down there. Heel has got a bit of a bend to it. 
which is a little bit common, I think, especially when he's got a foot there and he's, we found another footprint just up, uh, get my bush pointer here, right up in here, another one, so it would be uh, right foot, left foot and on. So there you go, right foot, left foot and out through the bush where the big fella lives. This is major trampling. This is last night. It come through here. And See your broken branches here? Yeah. So definitely something went through here. And look up this way here, and he doesn't look like it. Mm -mm. See, the prevailing wind when people are using this camp is northwest, summertime wind. We're in summer season at the end, but we have a southeast blowing, which is the prevailing winter wind. So with the northwest, this is where you want to come. Because right now, you're basically behind the cabin. You can scent it. You can smell the humans. So you'd want to come along here. And with your ear listening, remember how sound travels. If you yell from up a hill, it's hard for the people down below to hear you. But the people down below just talking, the guy up on top of the hill can hear him. So being elevated here, and then see how he's, he's not walking through there? Deer, elk, they just go anywhere. But whatever walks through here repeatedly, because all these branches have been cleared, and it's been cleared for years, because you can see the broken ones on the forest floor have started to be decomposed and brought into the forest. I built this camp in 2006. So 11 years something possibly has been using this trail. It's very straight. It's taking advantage of no silhouette. So it's got the rock bluff behind it. It has these trees for coverage, but you can hear the water down there at the camp. So if people are down there talking and making noise, you can hear it all. And the wind westerly, he's not going to be smelled. Now when he comes out into the kayak camp behind the outhouse, he has great observation. He can see and his scent won't be picked up by them. See, the animal doesn't realize that our scent is not as good as theirs. They just equate that we possibly have a nose as good as a deer or a wolf or a bear. So that's how you look at his trails and where he's setting up to observe you. So I'm going to give this back. To, let Thomas uh, poke at this thing around. He's got more experience than I do with a cast. So see what comes out of this again I'm not expecting too much because of the type of terrain we have here which is just needles and basically a sponge but the odds on our first night to get one of uh, something a cast by a creek in the mud or in the sand it's uh, we're lucky even if have seen these my disappointment was overshadowed by the footprint we found To discover the print. We packed up our things and headed back to the beginning of the hike. Vancouver Island and said goodbye to the land of the Sasquatch, I couldn't help but reflect on my findings and my feelings towards Bigfoot. The sense of purpose was fulfilled. So James, what have you taken from this experience that we've had north of Campbell River? I found it to be a, uh, an experience and a half, loaded with information and actually coming out with a lot more questions now. Mm. I was fascinated uh, with the stories from Thomas Seawood and the, and the energy of the crew we had up there. Uh, it, it was one of those 
that kind of group that came together with a focus and was testing each other to see to see how we each thought about it. And it was a very, very, very interesting way of looking at it. Plus, I really screwed my knee up, so that was fun too. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> which was an adventure and a half coming down with like a 50 pound pack on my wonky old knee, which swole up really good. Oh. So I felt like, um, you know, I, I, I was limping around some old treasure island. I should have had a crutch and hire and a parrot or something. But I found that one of the things that was really interesting is, uh, and this is how the way I come away from this, going in as a skeptic, uh, we woke up and check the tree for the cherries we had put in it. And, mm -hmm. and gosh darn it, they weren't all still there. So we started clearing things up and looked down and there was footprints everywhere that weren't there the day before. That was interesting because we were literally sleeping seven or eight yards away from where these footprints were found. Mm -hmm. And that soil there in this typical Vancouver Island coastal rainforest was primarily pine needles and I'm 235 pounds I'd jump up and down on that and my feet would go in about a quarter of an inch and I could literally watch that kind of spring back up these footprints that weren't there the day before because there were obvious <laughs> the next morning were two and a half to three inches into the ground yeah and if somebody had the energy and the stealth ability to get out there um, of stealth or not, they, they couldn't have pounded a hundred plus footprints into the ground that deep without one of us waking up because we're sleeping in a plywood shack that really didn't make for a really good sleep. Mm. So we're half asleep, half awake the whole night. There was, we we're all together and nobody could have done that. Nobody. Uh, and that's, we, we picked, uh, there was one gorgeous track, nice, great, big one. And I was pointing it out to uh, one of the people on the crew who then forgot about it and walked right through it and kind of scuffed the whole thing over. Mm -hmm. That was my first uh, one that I was going to uh, fill with my, uh, yeah. my plaster. And the second one ended up being that 22 inch by, I don't know, nine inch uh, track. And in hindsight, looking back at it, I'm thinking I actually probably missed a, a chunk at the front, a top end of it. It looked almost too much like a, a human, you know, little toe down here, big toe up here. Mm. And I, I'm sure I must have missed or, or broke off the piece that, that squared it a little on the top. But that was fascinating to me mm. on how deep that was in that ground and the number of them that went up through the bush where they'd come down. And there were two different sizes. Uh, which was fascinating. Unfortunately, the, and, and typically, uh, my understanding anyways, it, this is typical, it wasn't the type of ground you, you get an ideal footprint from. Right. Uh, it was pine needles. It, you know, there was no perfect clay or sand or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, typical. <laughs> when it comes to uh, that type of research, you're always going to end up finding a, something that's going to make it a little bit harder. But I came away thinking more of them being uh real uh from the sounds we heard the night before the knocking uh the hooting uh that definitely wasn't an owl mm. unless they have uh, owls with lips up there uh very very loud and nobody was going to follow us down into that camp area it was well well because off it's too, the road yeah too far yeah off. and uh i know it wasn't me because I was pretty well close to myself most of the night, uh, the, but and and it's so isolated. It's just an isolated place out there. Mm -hmm. What did you come away with? I came away with feeling solidified with my choice of Bigfoot being there and being present because, like you said, the knocking and the sounds. There's something that you can't explain. We're too far in for anything to make those noises, mm -hmm. other than Bigfoot, and even the presence of where we were. There's like something different there. It's not, it's hard to explain that feeling unless you're actually there, which I assume you felt something there. But yeah. to me, just even seeing those imprints, um, that like, no, like you said, nothing could make that. I found kind of unique too, is uh, when we talk about putting the cherries up in the tree, 
the reason we put cherries up in the tree is it's spoken to a psychic who's often on my uh, podcast, uh, mm. a lady out of south, south central Washington state named Skeeter Wellhouse. And she said, put cherries in the tree and see what happens. And I t when I told that to Thomas Seawood, he looked at his wife and they both kind of giggled because last time they were up there, they had cherries in a cooler outside of the hut they were in. And the next day the cooler was taken away. It was opened up. The only thing removed from the cooler were the cherries and the lid was put back on. Mm -hmm. So they thought that was fascinating. And, the, and with a psychic on the other side, you know, of Cascadia, basically telling us, oh, I think they like cherries, so put those in the tree. Yeah. Unfortunately, they didn't take them, but they did uh, mess with one of the night vision cameras. I think they see them or something, because they, they, the footprints came right down, they stopped and turned and walked right away. Yeah. They all came down to the tree and then left, like, ah, you're not going to catch mm -hmm. us. But oh. can't do anything about the footprints. Those. Yeah, that's still evidence. And imagine, like, like I say, I'm 235 pounds, I cannot make a footprint in that ground. And these things were two and a half to three inches into the ground. And staying. And staying, yeah. flattened. Uh, it, it, that was, to me, that was, and knowing we would hear the, anybody faking that, we would definitely have woken up or stuck our noses out and find out what the heck is going on mm -hmm. out there because it would have taken hours to do that many footprints and well, just pounding something into the ground, it would have made a lot of noise. Yeah. And, and I'm sure something made those footprints. And mm -hmm. it wasn't a bear. They weren't uh, staggered with back paw into the front paws. Uh, very few grizzly bear on Vancouver Island. They actually have to swim over mm -hmm. to that area. A lot of black bear, but black bear do not make footprints that are, you know, six, seven feet away from each mm -hmm. other, constant walking. And yeah. these weren't print over print. These were one foot hitting the ground and rolling and walking, which was absolutely fascinating. Yeah. We hope you've enjoyed coming along this journey to discover Bigfoot. This was one group's experience, and there are many others out there. We hope this gives you a little bit more information to decide if Bigfoot truly does exist. My name is Kiana, and I am Bigfoot Girl.